The Evil Dead 1981 Review and Thoughts. Welcome to Spooktober. I am dedicating this month to the Evil Dead series. I did already review the fifth movie in the series when it hit theaters, and now I'm doing the first four. So yeah, the, the trilogy as well as the remake. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved. This one will have some jokes, and I will get into some serious topics. If you're looking for a review that's like, oh, the effects don't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with those assessments or not, this is not that review. And, yeah, so the top link in the description box will enable you to donate to the SAG After Strikers, and I employ you to do so. And then there are some links to videos to help explain why this is such an important strike. So... It's time to struggle from to get out from under one small bookshelf that really does not look that heavy for an unreasonable amount of time. Let's dive in. Now, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And I start the video with a review where if I spoil anything, I'm almost definitely not going to. But if I do, I will verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and you see me lower my index finger. But, yeah, once I end the review itself, please note the rest of the review will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So, this movie was originally unrated and later rated NC-17. And, yeah, makes a lot of sense. You know, the MPAA said, substantial graphic horror violence and gore. The uh, IMDb Parents Guide lists sex and nudity as moderate, violent, and gore as severe, profanity as mild, alcohol, drugs, and smoking as mild, and frightening and intense scenes as severe. And that makes a lot of sense. This is if if you think that this movie might be like a little bit too graphic, too gory, too violent for you, you're almost definitely right. It is very, very violent and gory. And I think, you know, it's 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 a big part of why the movie is what it is. I, I get that not, it's not for everyone, and I don't blame anyone for not, you know, wanting that. And maybe even wishing that the movie did not do that. However, there are a lot of other movies that, you know, are very scary but don't have violence and gore, so... It's not like, you know, if you like the idea of horror movies, but you don't like gore, you just have nowhere to turn to. You know, this movie came out in 81, it was filmed in like 79. You know, in, in 1978, we had the original Halloween. That one has very little violence and almost no, like, gore. And so, I, I suppose, yes, it sort of depends on your definition of gore, but... You know, that one has some similarities to this. I wouldn't say that this is like a ripoff of it at all, but yeah, if you like some of the stuff that's in this movie, in, in theory, but you're afraid the violence and gore is too much, I recommend the original Halloween 1978. In general, I recommend that movie. So, yeah, um, I probably will not swear much in this since... They don't swear that much in the movie either. And that brings us to... Yeah, um, I am going off the... Ah, uh, crap, what's it called again? I... I think it's the, the uncut version that I watched... Um, as far as I know, they didn't remove anything from the, um, let's see. Yeah, um, yes, as far as I know, the version I have watched is uncut. Uh, I must have watched it at least a dozen times by now. And right, and and that is definitely the version that I do recommend. And uh, let's see, the first time I watched it was in two thousand six, 
and the most recent viewing was right before I hit record for this video so it is very fresh in my mind so the plot a few young like college aged people go to a small cabin in the woods only to have to deal with terrifying evil spirits tormenting them and the let's see yeah the the movie handles twists and and the like quite well and nothing in the movie like just you know there there are a number of horror movies where something that happens fairly late in it kind of just it it falls apart at that point that never happens with this movie. Now, this was both written and directed by Sam Raimi. And let's see. So the. Oh, that's right. I actually forgot. Yeah. Um, I have a full ranking of all of the Sam Raimi movies I've watched. Somehow I forgot to copy it in to the. But I will have it momentarily, and here we go. Yes. So, rank worst to best of all Sam Raimi, all the Sam Raimi movies I've watched, and really the yeah, the one at the very bottom is the only one that I don't love. And the following list will not include this particular movie, but yeah. So, Spider-Man 3, Dragman Hell, Oz, The Quick and the Dead, The Gift, Spider-Man 1 and 2, Evil Dead 2, Doctor Strange 2, Evil Dead 3, A Simple Plan, and Dark Man 1. And, yeah, the... And, and I'm also in... I'm gonna list my ranking for this series, but keep this particular movie out of it. At the end of this review, I will let you know where this particular movie ranks but yeah I love all all five of them ranked worst to best Evil Dead 2 Army of Darkness the remake and Rise and yeah this this movie is what you get if you take like a base of like horror comics easy horror comics you you mix it with a hefty amount of Hitchcock, sprinkle in a little bit of George A. Romero, maybe a little bit, just not just you know to to taste, a little bit of Roman Polanski, smidgen, just just pinch of. I shit you not, Shakespeare. Yeah, this is this is the movie that that you get. I I don't know if it would be a tasty meal, but the movie is amazing. Something you notice immediately here is the passion and glee of of you know, yeah, everyone working on this. Not only Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, but really everyone that oozes from every frame of this in a thick, viscous, oily, or tar-like fluid. When it isn't being projectile vomited directly onto your face, into your mouth, it's infectious. And I don't mean in the sense that you need to get medical treatment afterwards. Well, okay, not only that. The enjoyment rubs off on you and all over you. There's just so much creativity, imagination, old-school filmmaking, practical effects, visceral gore, you know... That is like so many other things in the movie, sometimes scary, sometimes funny, sometimes both, sometimes both. If you watch this and it doesn't really get much of a reaction you, it must just be because you've watched it too many times. But, you know, whether you watch it when you're seven, by the way, please do not show this to a seven-year-old, or 100, you're going to have some sort of reaction to this. Even all these years later. You know, this, this movie came out 42 years holy crap and uh, you know yeah um, I already mentioned the the yeah horror comics and Hitchcock 
you know, a major element here is the same Raimi grew up watching Hitchcock and reading horror comics. He combined, combines the tension suspense of Hitchcock, where everything is set up, built up, nothing just comes out of the blue, very unusual for a lot of 80s horror, which was very often just your bang for your buck, with these incredibly gooey, gory horror effects. I'll grant the, the gore effects were in a lot of 80s movies, but this combination was very unusual. You know, the 80s was really when it started, in, in part because of just technology, like, you know, latex opened a lot of, of you know, there were a lot of new opportunities what you could do with like horror effects that just was not quite the case in the 60s and 70s you know you you really I love the original Dawn of the Dead and yes I am going to do a video I'm I intend to do you know vlogs on all three parts of the trilogy of the dead you know which I have on DVD they are they are planned they will to you know but you can, and, and to be clear, there is also some really amazing stuff in the in Dawn of the Dead. But, you know, some of the stuff in, in Day of the Dead is just even more, you know, yeah. Actually, yeah, uh, I suppose I should, actually, yeah, by, by 78, which is when Dawn of the Dead, the original, came out, you know, they already had a lot to, to work with, but earlier in the 70s they did not really have yeah and this is one of those movies that it's it's one of the first movies to have this kind of thing and yeah let's see the yeah and the uh, Um, hmm, is that? Yeah, so the the camera work is hyperkinetic, and you know the the acting is not necessarily like convincing, but they are like putting in there's there's enthusiasm and energy there. You know, and yeah, Bruce gives it his all and is very charismatic. It's no wonder he got a career. And really, you know, everyone here had at least some career after this. And I, this, uh, let's see, this was the first time that Campbell was in a feature film. Uh, you know, some of the other actors had acted before. This movie is definitely more about horror than humor compared to the second and third movies in the trilogy. And, and, you know, somewhat like the remake also. And, yeah, the effects are very old school. They do all the different types that make sense. There's some stuff that's as simple as, you know, blood dripping, some makeup that was not very complicated. Some of it, do some of it does get more complicated. But, you know, some of it's just like pale skin, contact lenses that make their eyes completely white and were a real pain to deal with. But then you also have puppetry, claymation squibs, rubber limbs, you know, and uh, like Crank, both Crank movies, which is another gen generation's version of this thing, although yes, obviously a different genre, just made to and excels at getting the adrenaline pumping to entertain as much as possible for 90 minutes or less, in this case less, no waste of time, just do what you think will have the best impact on the audience, you know, these are some of the movies where describing them as style over substance is not an insult. And Raimi did go on to make movies of substance, such as A Simple Plan, The Gift. And, yeah, this was long before elevated horror became a term, back when expectations for horror were, were low. You know, horror in the 80s, there were some that are amazing. I do maintain that the the several of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies are absolutely amazing, you know. But a lot of them, it was just kind of, you know, let's have a lot of blood and gore, and, you know, they made a lot of money, so a lot of filmmakers were just delivering the bare minimum kind of thing. And that's, you know, 
that's part of why this movie is so amazing because it really does stand out as a very obvious passion project. You know, the original Friday the 13th was famously literally made to keep the lights on. They, they nobody working on it was super passionate about it. They had like a sports movie that they wanted to get you know into theaters and it was like what we we're you know running out of money we got to do something to keep you know and nobody remembers the sports movie today you know this movie yeah very much a passion project and it's it's clear from every frame they do an amazing job building tension with audio that the audience but not characters can hear that implies the presence of the supernatural evil before we see anything that clearly indicates it you know and and some deceptively simple but very effective setups such as the the key above the door you know once the horror really starts they have patience to not go all out right away so it builds over the course of the film where there are some movies that try for the sort of thing but have something too big too early on and they're never able to get to that level again for the rest of the movies so the audience just gets frustrated waiting for that and one of the most famous shots in this movie is this POV think Halloween you know Halloween 1978 does something amazing as well original Friday the 13th does something pretty meh but you know it's 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 such a beloved shot that it's actually the intro you know you know how some DVDs will have like part of you know just a brief clip show before the yeah before as the menu is loading basically yeah, they used the POV shot from this movie for that, and it's it's absolutely amazing. It's this tracking shot where the camera moves very fast between trees through the woods, and it's kind of ingenious in its simplicity. Like, they had a 2x4 strap, strapped a camera to it, ran through the woods, but because we hadn't seen it before, it had a really strong impact. You know, it, in comparison, you know, I mentioned I love the, the 1978 Halloween also, and that bit, you know, that one, it's much more this, like, steady sort of, you know, you, you, yeah, it's, it's much less, like, fast-paced, you know, and it's not that director John Carpenter is unable to make something fast-paced, as he proved later, although at the time maybe he didn't quite have the money, but yeah, they're they're different different approaches, but work really well. I'm I'm glad that neither of them tried to do the other. Uh, let's see. yeah, you know, Sam Raimi and his friends came in, didn't have a studio behind them telling them you can't do that, so they did it, and the movie is unlike anything we'd ever seen in the mainstream before almost the entire movie is set in just just a few areas that they had access to you know so the the money could go to special effects and equipment which back then was much more expensive than if the movie were made today and yeah the movie gets a lot of mileage out of the fact that nature is still raw we can't control it there's anxiety there you know we we live a lot of us today live a much more sheltered life, not necessarily, like, not enough, not sheltered enough under capitalism, but, you know, we, we are not, like, living in the woods quite, and, yeah, this, this movie uses, and, and this is something that, you know, there, there are a number of, of horror movies where, you know, some some people will will go to an isolated place and there's and something scary happens there this is one of those movies that takes that concept and actually uses the setting it's not just that it's isolated it actually you know yeah there's just there's something we can't we can't completely control nature I completely understand 
the people who find it deeply frustrating, I just kind of go with it, that the characters make such strange, stupid, careless decisions that are basically there to make the movie happen. And this is something the remake and Evil Dead Rise both take steps to do away with in their scripts, and they largely succeed in eliminating in, in those. It is something that was common to, to 80s horror, and... I think it's also worth noting, you know, some people suggest maybe this movie and the, the rest of the trilogy are supposed to be parody and or satire of, you know, the slashers and other teen-oriented horror, you know, from, from like the, the 70s and 80s, you know, came out in the 80s, filmed in, 80, in 79, you know, yeah, um, I agree. I think it is meant to... Yeah. Let's see. And I have watched dozens of zombie movies. And yes, I realize an argument could be made that this isn't quite a zombie movie. A lot of them mine some tension and drama from the idea that maybe someone we care about will turn and someone else will have to tragically take them out, even though they care about each other. This one does that as well, but. In this, when a physical being is like a zombie and is attacking a character, a character we know, it is always a character that we've already met that has that that has turned. You know, a lot of zombie movies, a huge chunk of the zombies that we see are ones we never met as human beings first. Like you look at them and they look human, you can appreciate they must have originally been a regular person, but it just doesn't hit, hit quite as hard as some that you've already met and you could say a few words to describe and they also hear speak taunting the humans tormenting them verbally very effective not saying every zombie film should do that but I'm really glad that this film does let's see and you know one of the possessed puts on a high-pitched girly voice or more so than she already had and says some children's rhymes intensely creepy and I, I would also say, you know, this is a movie that very quickly gives you a sense of who the individual characters are. Like, there are slasher movies where, you know, you realize major things about certain characters fairly late into the movie. There's some slashers where I would say I can watch the entire movie and still not really describe certain of the characters like they have so little personality and definition and in this they actually like you get a sense of some of the characters and some of the character relationships in the first few minutes like I don't know if I wanna go too much into exactly but I just say you know yeah you know one one character is like something of a of a, um she she draws really well the first time you see her she's got a pad and a pencil in her hand in her lap you know even though they're in a, a car so I'm not sure you'd necessarily be able to draw real well there but it's there you know you immediately are like oh this is you know the this is the artist of the of the group you know and Bruce Campbell's character Ash you know, tries to be, you know, optimistic, and his girlfriend Linda seems to, you know, the the you know he'll he'll say you know it'll it'll be fun, and she's like yeah you know it's just it's it's fairly simple, but it yeah you get a sense of you know this is their relationship, you know, and yeah the the other male character Scott is pretty stupid and not careful enough from right away which does of course come back I can imagine some might feel it's weird that the people who go to this cabin are these two young couples and then this young woman who's single the way I see it they would probably have felt bad for not inviting her and she's like she's Ash's sister so yeah it's it's one of those things yeah and 
The gore does not start right away, but the fear does, and even if you're mainly here for the gore, you don't have to wait for as long as some other classic movies. And also, like, if you just want the gore to start really, really early, you know, take your pick of any of the other movies. The other four, the gore starts sooner. When the camera should remain still, which is fairly rarely the case here, it does. Michael Bay, from what I've seen, prefers to always keep the camera moving even when it shouldn't. You know, there's there's this one... And, yeah, on at least one occasion, like, several... All, all five of these characters will have something to say about the most recent development, and the camera will start on one, move to another, to another, to another, until all five have delivered their lines, instead of cutting to, to single or even double shots of, of the various characters. And it just works really well. It, it really keeps you in the moment, you know. And I did see at least one user review that said they didn't believe the movie could be both funny and scary, suggested it was wrong that some people in their reviews were praising the humor, other reviews were praising how scary it is. At least the person had enough self-awareness to say, I am H.O., so I'll just very quickly explain anything that is scary, if you push it far enough, ends up being funny. It can work really well to make a horror or horror movie or TV show be both funny and scary. You know, horror is about building tension. Comedy is about relieving it. You see it in this movie, especially in the second and third movies. You see it in Scream Queens. I do think there are things in this movie, you know, Evil Dead 1, that wasn't meant to be funny, but comes across as funny because of how far it pushes it. But I don't really think it makes a lot of sense to claim that nothing in the movie is meant to be funny. And and it's patently absurd to claim that nothing in it is meant to be scary. And I, I yeah, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to claim that it's impossible for a movie to be both funny and scary. You know, and if you want a more mainstream example, I haven't been, you know, I stopped watching Simpsons like uh, 20 years ago, I guess, by now. Um, but back when they, you know, so the first several years, the f yeah, the first, un so yeah, multiple years worth, the Treehouse of Horror episodes, both funny and scary. And, uh, like anything that is at least partially inspired by H.P. Lovecraft and demonizes non-Christian belief systems, this is unfortunately somewhat racist, and honestly, it could easily have been about Christianity. It, you know, Christianity features one of the most famous zombies in Jesus, but I can't appreciate that the movie didn't want to enrage the Christians, who, let's be honest, look for any excuse to be offended about their religion and its depiction in media, as if there are not countless pieces of media that have a positive and propagandistic depiction of it. But the reason for there being some supernatural evil didn't need to be, well, supernatural. It could have been, a, you know, somewhat, on though fairly dubious science, like the original Night of the Living Dead, a movie that this one does take inspiration from in some other respects, such as how few settings there are. And there's a, very early on, a female character says that she's, scared or uncomfortable and a male character like teases her and they specifically in the comment commentary track call that out as a deliberate homage to the original Night of the Living Dead. I'm not 100% certain if this is the first case but it's possible that this is where the idea began that slasher movies and other horror movies aimed at teenagers should be idiots go to a creepy isolated obviously deserted place just to party instead of you know partying in some place that isn't isolated. I mean, holy crap, I know that the Beastie Boys, you know, rapped about you gotta fight for your right to party. Didn't think you had to go this far off the map, almost literally, to find a place to safely party. And I appreciate that the evil force here is cruel, not indifferent or misunderstood. I do think there's a lot of compelling stories to tell where 
you know, the villain is indifferent or misunderstood in, you know, and we've seen a lot of that in more recent years, I do think there's a, there's something really, really great about this kind also. And that, right, so there are some things that I wanted to, yeah, um, according to IMDb Trivia, the, yeah, the cabin used as the film set was also lodging for 13 crew members with several people sleeping in the same room. Living conditions were terrible, and the crew frequently argued the cabin didn't have plumbing, so the actors went days without showering, fell ill frequently in the freezing weather. By the end of production, they were burning furniture to stay warm. Andy Granger, a friend of Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi, gave them this advice. Fellas, no matter what you do, keep the blood running down the screen. And there is a scene where blood literally runs down a screen as as a tribute to to that and let's see the um, right and yeah after completing principal photography in the winter of 79 and 80 most of the actors left the production however there was still much of the film to be completed most of the second half of the film features various stand-ins, or fake shemps, to replace the actors who left. And... The film's first cut ran around 117 minutes, which Bruce Campbell called an impressive achievement in light of the 65-minute length of the screenplay. It was then edited down to a more marketable 85 minutes. The original version was conceived as a horror drama with the occasional joke to bring some levity and would focus on the terror that made it to the final pro product, but also tragedy. And after watching the first cut, Raimi Campbell and Tapert agreed that the film was already grim enough and trimmed it to a straight horror film. I can imagine that it probably is a... A, a tough sit on account of that I would still really love to see it just yeah just just to to compare just because I'm I'm interested in the, the filmmakers and filmmaking but but you know this was I'm, I'm not sure they would really have kept it around because you know like today if you film something on digital and you end up cutting a lot out, you might be able to save the stuff that you cut out on like a hard drive, but back then, we're talking, you know, big reels of film, you know, you gotta keep that... If you don't keep it in the, in the exact right conditions, it can really deteriorate. They were already running out of money, so it's probably lost. And in an interview, Betsy Baker said when she learned she, the producers were interested in having her star in a horror movie, she was so suspicious she would only meet them in a public restaurant. And yeah, uh, Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell were friends from high school where they made many Super 8 films together. They would often collaborate with Sam's brother, Ted Raimi. Campbell became the actor of the group as he was the one the girls wanted to look at. And Campbell has played brief parts and cameos in most of Sam Raimi's movies ever since. You know, there's a lot of Raimi movies where you're literally just sitting there like, when, when's Campbell showing up, you know? And, yeah, there's, there's this very eerie wind noise in the movie, and that was actually... That wasn't, like, created. Sam Raimi heard it through his bedroom window while he was trying to sleep, thought it would be perfect for the movie, so he recorded it, and it ended up in the movie, and just, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and one of the most intricate moments during editing was the stop-motion sequence, which took hours to cut properly, and it, it paid off. It was worth it, in my opinion. 
and let's see. Yeah, the you know the the cabin was you know the the property owner granted the production crew to lease the cabin under the condition that any modifications made for filming were to be undone and they kept their promise Let's see. and When there wasn't any filming, Bruce Campbell would actually help out with the crew in prepping shots and props around the set. And Sam Raimi originally wanted to title this film Book of the Dead, but producer Irvin Shapiro changed the title to The Evil Dead for fear that kids would be turned off seeing a movie with a literary reference. Which, yeah, that's you know honestly there's probably sadly some some <laughs> that's probably somewhat accurate right uh, RIP Irvin Shapiro is Irvin it's gotta be like the is that the the any relation to Ben Shapiro nah. Because I know that Ben Shapiro wanted to be a filmmaker, which is why he's so hostile towards Hollywood. In addition to just being an all-around bastard. Anyway, the... The film was shown to Stephen King, and it was his glowing endorsement, which was later used on the film's ads and posters, of the film which really sold it to the public, and the film was bought by New Line Cinema soon after. And, yeah, in addition to being it being Bruce Campbell's feature debut, it's also Sam Raimi's. And Joel Cohen was an assistant editor on the film. It is kind of wild to me, considering how different their movies are, but yeah, the Coen brothers and Sam Raimi are friends, and or, or were at the time, I don't know if they still are, you know, and yeah, helped on, helped each other on various movies. And I think that might be about... Right, and yeah, on the very first day of shooting, the crew got lost in the woods, which helps you realize how far away from regular, like, modern society this actually was. And, yeah, the movie has several... bits in in the final film where you can somewhat see you know there's there's at least one shot where an actor flubs a line and like steps out of the shot because you know he's yeah and yeah they they left it in there's stuff where you can see where the makeup ends and and someone's actual face stars and such and, you know, it's the kind of thing where some people don't like that. I think it gives the movie a certain charm. I, I don't really want... I'm, I'm sure someone has, like, gone and, like, digitally fixed those or something, you know. But, yeah, I, I prefer it this way. Right, and dead chickens were stabbed to replicate the sounds of mutilated flesh, and Bruce Campbell had to scream into a microphone for several hours. And... Um, that might be about... 
it for the IMDb trivia. Um, right, uh, Sam Raimi shot a short film called Within the Woods to act as a calling card for his feature debut. It did the trick. He was able to raise the 90000 necessary to make the film. I have not... Uh, I don't have a copy of Within the Woods. I would like to, to watch it, but that is very clever. To You know, this... It doesn't work for, for everyone. Um, I know that... Uh, the the Donnie Darko, uh, I'll have the director's name momentarily, Richard Kelly said that he regretted doing it for, I believe it was Donnie Darko, but for a lot of people, you know, yeah, proof of concept, you know, if you can show what you're getting at, you know, and, and basically point to that and say it's going to be, you know, ten times as long and and you know there's going to be a lot more gore, more more story, more build up. Yeah, that can work really well. And the film's budget was an estimated three hundred and fifty thousand. Sam Raimi Sam Raimi later made Spider-Man three on a three hundred fifty million dollar budget. So yeah, it's. You, you could say that his career had, you know, got, got bigger. He got to work on bigger movies after this. And... Let's see. Um, right, and yeah, Ted Raimi was used as a substitute in many scenes when the original actor was either busy or preoccupied. And... Yeah. See, um, that might be right. To accommodate Sam Raimi's style of direction, several elaborate low budget rigs had to be built since the crew could not afford a camera dolly. One involved the Vazo Cam, which relied on a mounted camera that was slid down long wood platforms to create a more fluid sense of motion. Right, I did see at least one user review saying that the cinematography in this movie was bad. I don't even know what... Uh, explain to me what's good in the cinematography, please. Let me know what movie that is low budget have you watched that tried to do something similar to this that had better cinematography. Just, yeah... And let's see the um, uh, that might be about it for the right and yeah at one point they they used cigarette smoke instead of dust caught in sunlight. And according to director Sam Raimi, producer Rob Tabert just s stood just off camera smoking while the shot was being filmed. And right, uh, despite its controversy and many technical goofs, this is considered to be one of the greatest horror films of all time. Many fans claim it is due to its amount of gore and execution of terror, while critics claim it is due to its constant reliance on visual storytelling and gripping performances. And, yeah, I think there's truth to both. And, yeah, so the, the opening of the movie does a really great job setting up what the movie's going to be like, setting a tone. You know, there's a lot of horror movies that only get good after a little while. This one, like, frame one, you are immediately invested. And I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or sad ending, but the ending fits what came before. I think the ending is absolutely perfect. And... Yeah, the ending titles are also good. If it's, they're, they're simple, they're minimalistic, but they're, they're really great. And, uh, you know, they're, they're not super long either. I recommend uh, sitting through them.
and um, so yeah, the dialogue definitely has some very some of it I, I'm not entirely sure if it was written to be as as comedic as it ends up coming off. Yeah. Um there are twenty five entries in the IMDB quote section and yeah you know, some of it is not necessarily good dialogue, but it's all worth looking up. It's all entertaining. Now, the cinematography was handled by Tim Philo. And that's right, he actually hasn't done very many. Let's see. Um, that's right, this is actually the only feature that he DP'd. Um, yeah, uh, he, he was also cinematographer on Within the Woods, and let's see, three, three shorts, and this one thing called Sam Raimi's Early Shorts, yeah, um, that's right, he was, he was director of photography, second unit for Evil Dead 2, but he yeah, he, he, you know, camera and electrical department. He has nine credits, several of which are feature. But yeah, um, I I don't know. Um, I guess it, I I would have guessed that he had a longer career, a, a bigger career than that. And it's edited by Edna Ruth Paul, who had, yeah, there's there's four total credits, three others. Um, one is a TV series, oh, yeah, she edited five episodes of ABC After School Specials. But she also edited feature-length Fear No Evil and Dirty Mouth. A Lenny Bruce movie, but not the one with ah crap. What was um, I can't believe I'm blanking on. I think it was it just called Lenny. The, yeah, not not the Dustin Hoffman movie, but yeah. Um, I suppose maybe I I think they deserved more, but it is perhaps because it was seen as well Raimi is the one telling them how to do it so that's why he ended up with so much of a career and they didn't so much but yeah um, I think I have said everything that I had about the specific editing and cinematography. So yeah, this was filmed in parts of Tennessee and Michigan. And someone just added USA to the... and five people thought that was helpful, three thought it wasn't, to the filming location list. I mean, they're not wrong. In, in their defense, that is, that is correct. But, but yeah, it gets a lot out of the fact that it is, like, you know, it is also, they couldn't have shot in a studio because it was this independent, you know, nobody knew them. You know, they got enough money to make the movie, but, yeah. But it absolutely, it makes the movie much better than if it had been, like, studio. And... That brings us to... Yeah, the music is also really well handled. And, yeah, composed by Joseph Leduca, who has 105 finished credits to his name as composer. And, yeah, still working today. which you know that's that's quite impressive to be working for so many years 
and yeah, a bunch of, it's not all horror, but a lot of genre pictures, and yeah, just, uh, you know, right, yeah, he went on to compose for Xena, and before that, Hercules, so yeah, you know, they, he and Sam Raimi had a great working relationship, and yeah, he, he went on to do the two latter parts of the Evil Dead trilogy as well. And yeah, it's just, it's very, very tense and suspenseful. Really builds atmosphere and really helps just set a tone. And the sound design is absolutely amazing. There's so many gnarly, squelchy, nasty noises that just really help sell the the gore the, the visual gore effects. And it's a movie that never really like I think some people would uh, disagree if I said that it hits the ground running. Although that is fairly literate like one of the first shots, the camera man is running, but it is definitely a movie that immediately gets to the point. Like, they they aren't at the cabin from minute one, but they arrive there very, very shortly into the movie. You know, we see them in the car, we see what they're like before they reach it, so that we can appreciate how it affects them. To, to be there and yeah they they get there very very quickly and it does not take very many minutes from them arriving there to bad stuff happening you know there's a lot of you know I, I would for example say the original Friday the 13th like there's there's these really padded sequences where we're just watching people do stuff and it's like uh, yeah I'm sure they would those characters would be doing that stuff in this particular situation and you know some of it they're like trying to make it like creepy and foreboding and, and eerie because there's like it's the POV shot and you can see someone is watching it but it just doesn't work it's not effective at all and you're just waiting for something to you know because they had to get it to 90 minutes you know, and this is, this movie, nothing like that. Nothing in this movie feels like padding. It's, you know, if you if you early on feel like, well, nothing has really happened yet, it's because you're seeing build-up. It's a setup. Yeah, setup and build-up. You know, I, I defy anyone. Point me to something that happens late in this film, anything at all, and... That, that you feel there is no setup for, that you feel comes out of the blue. And I will point you to something earlier in the film that provides some, some setup. It's, it's uncanny. Like, the, they really very carefully set everything up. And, yeah, just fantastic. The movie is 81 minutes without end credits and only 82 with end credits. You know, not not a lot of credits because it's it's independent. You know, but yeah, that one minute of end credits is is very effectively creepy and yeah, and yeah, if if you give it the first twenty or thirty minutes, if by then nothing in the movie really interests you, yeah, the movie might just not really be for you. And, yeah, uh, the best elements, it's a tie between the creativity on display, the dark sense of humor, the performances, just this gonzo, like, they, they just, they had a vision, and they were gonna put it on the screen no matter what. And the worst aspect is definitely the raging misogyny, which I will get into in the spoiler sections. You know, I, I can't really say much about it without spoiling anything. 
uh, I've seen some people say, you know, and, and yeah, whether or not that ruins the movie for you is, uh, you know, a, a subjective, uh, you know, op opinion. You know, I, I completely understand anyone who feels it does ruin the movie. You know, obviously me, me, I don't. You know, I'm I've been raving about how amazing it is. You know, but I do I do consider it a problem for the movie. And the yeah, when you know, reading other reviews, the the thing I saw some say as the the biggest problem with it, the worst thing was that it does not offer enough variety. And I can see where they're coming from. Um, yeah. It's it's definitely a thing of if you're not really vibing with it, you're gonna feel like it's not that there's not enough variety. You know, if if you if you're getting into it, then in my opinion, it it just absolutely works throughout. But I completely understand, you know, and it is definitely it is one of those things that. Uh, what's the word? Um, I don't personally think that it is a case of it should have just been a short film. I think there's enough material, but yeah, I do understand. And it, it is not for everyone, absolutely. The, the before I first watched it, the thing I was most worried about was that it would be really, really dated and like the stuff that really counts. I don't think is the thing I was most looking forward to was Raimi just letting loose and yeah, the movie absolutely exceeded my expectations there. The trailers do give at least a little too much away. Uh, I will definitely also say they do give you a good idea of what the movie is like. And the trailers are worth watching. The cover and poster don't give too much away and give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like, as much as a, you know, a still image can for something so visually big, you know. The, the covers and posters are worth looking up on IMDB and on Rotten Tomatoes this has an 86 percent based on 83 reviews only 12 of them rotten it is certified fresh and the audience score based on over a hundred thousand ratings is 84 percent the average rating is 4.1 out of 5 so yeah and the consensus so scrappy that it feels as illicit as a book found in the woods. The Evil Dead is a stomach-churning achievement in bad taste that marks a startling debut for Wunderkind Sam Raimi. And yeah, uh, let's see. So briefly, a couple of the rotten reviews. One person says, you know the. The plot is ridiculously familiar. Characters are dizzying, simplistic. Yeah, if that's the kind of thing that will bother you, it definitely, definitely will bother you in this movie. And one person says a child could do better, which, yeah, I mean, to each their own, completely disagreed. And. Yeah, yeah, one one person basically says it's too gory and and also not enough um not enough variety. Okay, so the, it, this doesn't really tell us anything, but it is kind of funny. We need a movie like this about as much as the creature from the Black Lagoon needed swimming lessons. Yeah, I I disagree, but that is a funny way to say that you thought it was unnecessary. And yeah, one person says the t the general tone is ludicrously bananas. Yeah, you know, some for some people that's gonna be a negative. I think it's a positive, but yeah. Um, 
One person says the script is banal. I do think Raimi has done better writing later, but this is, you know, let's let's keep in mind, you know, he made this when he was like 20 or 21. You know, for for that, it is very impressive. The the script, I think, the filmmaking is impressive regardless. One person says that they did not think it was scary and thought it was like Plan 9 from Outer Space of the 80s. And one person says it has no central idea. Or no, and no idea at all, in fact. Which, I mean, no, I, I don't really agree, but I... Yeah, was this 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 review was apparently from 2023? Like I mentioned, you know, today we have different expectations, and sometimes you know there are classic horror movies that do have a lot to say. You know, I earlier mentioned the original Dawn of the Dead, for example, which you know that came out one year of, that was film that was released one year before this movie came out. Before this movie was filmed, wow, I did not get enough sleep last night. I don't know if you can tell. Um, so, you know, there were some, and, and certainly the 70s, there were a number of movies that had, like, big ideas to, to convey. I think it's just that it's more satirical and kind of... I'll, I'll try to talk about what I, what I feel is the, the idea of the movie in the spoiler sections. And, yeah, one person says it's the movie's notable as the announcement of an eager talent. And one person says it feels like a dud movie claiming spoof status. And one person uses the word disgusting, and I think they mean it negatively, although, you know, with this movie, I don't think that's really a criticism so much as just description. You know, I love how disgusting it is, other than the misogyny, I mean. And, wow, one person says, this was directed with no sense of style, which just, okay, whatever, dude, whatever. If, if that's how you feel about it, then that's how you feel about it, and I guess that's how you feel about it, but could not disagree more. On Metacritic, it has a 71 out of 100 based on 11 critic reviews, generally favorable, 73% positive, 18% mixed, 9% negative, and the, yeah, the negative one is the one I quoted before, ridiculously familiar plot. Let's see, the, um, um one of the mixed ones says, idiotic, but propelled by energy and enthusiasm. And, yeah, one of the, the, the other mixed reviews says, you can't help but wondering if Raimi and Co. didn't have some women issues to work through. That I do think is a fair criticism. I, I don't blame anyone who hates this movie for the misogyny. And the, on, yeah. On Metacritic, the users have given it a score of 8.1 out of 10, universal acclaim, 83% positive, 11% mixed, and only 6% negative. And let's see if we can find some of the negatives to real quick. <laughs> yeah, one person says it's not scary. To each their own, I guess. And one, let's see. Yeah, and one, yeah, one person, one person says the movie scares solely rely on jump scares and gore. Again, completely disagree. There's a lot of much more subtle scares. And. Yeah, one person gave it a 0 out of 10 and opens by talking about the misogyny. Again, 100%. I, I don't blame anyone for, for that. Yeah, and one person says that the 
the gore effects are dated and because of that they don't like it. Um, I think that is about a yeah one person says you know Evil Dead 2 is much better which I can appreciate and Yeah, several of these mixed reviews don't really sound that negative, so I don't really have any. Yeah, that is whoops, that is it for that. And on MRQE, the which you know ah, what's it called again? It's a uh, it it like collects ratings and reviews you know it uh, yeah that one gives it 74 out of 100 with more slightly more b votes than a votes some c votes a few d's and zero f scores now on imdb it has a 7.4 out of 10 which is very high for, you know, the little movie that could. You know, there's a there's a lot of big budget movies that are way lower lower scored, and some of them look significantly more professional and polished than this. You know, but just yeah, the energy, the passion, the unique qualities of just yeah. Now uh, there were yeah there are two hundred twenty six thousand user ratings on IMDb 26.9 percent gave an 8 24.4 gave 7 15.1 a 10 12.5 a 9 11 point zero a 6 four point seven a 5 two point two a four one point three gave it three another one point three gave it a one zero point nine gave it two and yeah the there are 1,001 user reviews, and if you hide spoilers, it's 829 on IMDb. The I, I read the the top 100. Eight gave it a one out of ten. Two gave it a two. No one gave it a three. Another two gave it a four. One gave it a five. Two gave it a six. Eleven gave it a seven. Twenty gave it an eight. Twenty-three gave it a nine, and twenty-six gave it a 10. So overwhelmingly the the most popular user reviews on IMDb are the ones that love the movie. And you know, yeah, like a fourth of them are the ones that thought it was practically perfect. You know, that's what a 10 out of 10 means. You know, um, yeah. And there are 236 links in the IMDb external reviews section. I've already talked some about the special effects. I can briefly add, you know, it is not as, you know, if you if you compare it to, you know, came out in 81, 82 had the thing, you know, with a bigger budget, with studio backing, yeah, that one, and and also, you know, it's it's it sucks that we have to compare this so much to '80s stuff because it, you know, eight, yeah, stuff from '81, '82, and such because it was that they started filming in '79. They, yeah, filmed across '79, '80, and, and such. So, but yeah, you know, the the thing does have superior special effects, but as I just explained, that's not really an insult to this movie. You know, and if you that's if you if you love good effective gore and you want more natural acting and like a more distinct sort of if the if if it's very important for the theme to be very relevant culturally to the time that the movie came out, 
yeah, I, you know, in general, I recommend The Thing from 1982, one of my favorite movies, not just horror movies, but movies in general. But, but yeah, you know, the, the, the kind of stuff that John Carpenter and David Cronenberg were, were doing around the same time, if lower budgeted, yeah, this, uh, yeah. And uh, some people would definitely say that there are too many effects. I respectfully disagree. I, you know, I acknowledge that even for the time this was, like, if you compare the, you know, one year after this came out, you had the first Friday the 13th, you know, I get why people loved it at the time. I can sit down and watch, you know, I've, I've said this in other videos, I can, pretty much any time of, of day of the year, whatever, I can sit down, I can put on any of the Friday the 13th movies, yes, even the remake, and I can really, really enjoy sitting through it, you know, but... Yeah, you know, that movie came out, you know, well, yeah. Came out in 80. This came out in 81. There's a lot more gore in, in this movie, you know. And, yeah, part of it is that, you know, Sam Raimi was reading, you know, when, when he was growing up, he was reading all these horror comics. And I, I have to admit, I myself have read very few of them, but... Yeah, like if you, you know, the the thing is, if you're drawing, if you're if you're a good artist and you have just enough time, enough, you know, you can really you can draw the kind of gore that you you know anything you can think of, you can you can draw given enough time, and movies took a little while to catch up to that. You know, let's see, when were I, I forget exactly when, but so if, if we just say EC Horror, uh, let's see, um, hmm, maybe we can, um, let's see, EC Horror Library was yeah in in 71 they they released the EC horror library and that was a bunch of stories that had already been you know it was a collection of 23 stories that yeah had been previously so yeah they could draw anything they could dream up stuff that you might see in animation but you could not do in live action yet and Sam Raimi, as soon as the, the the technology was there, yeah, he he put it in live action in this movie. And a lot of people, like if you didn't grow up with this very gory horror, yeah, you're you might think it's excessive. And I, I guess it's it's ultimately subjective. You know, I'm I'm not gonna tell anyone that they're wrong for thinking this movie is excessive that's definitely you know but again that is part of the appeal for a lot of people and yeah you know the the I think I've said everything I had about the effects right actually yes one more thing about the effects they actually you know, I, I already mentioned that when something bad happens to a character in this movie, it's a character we know. It's it's never just, oh, it's a zombie. I mean, I can see from their face they used to be a human being, but I've never met them. I can appreciate the tragedy of, of becoming a zombie, but I don't know them, though. And, and in this movie, they actually even use the things that we know about the characters. You know, someone will become possessed... And they will verbally torment someone that the, the you know the the not possessed host loves this other person, and they'll say things that just that really just cut like a like a knife, you know. Just yeah, you know Sam Raimi. I don't think it's always to the benefit in, in his movies. I think he pushed the cruelty too far in the Spider-Man movies. But, 
certainly he does like to include cruel evil in a number of his movies you know and and yeah that's again like you know some of the not all there were definitely some excellent cruel you know like the the xenobites very very cruel also you know the first hellraiser coming out in 87 so you know the 80s definitely did have and freddy krueger who i mentioned earlier very very cruel but not all of them some of them it was just you know someone's going around stalking and or killing which is scary which is you know but it just it adds that extra oomph that they're also so cruel and yeah you know you you it it just it hits really hard because we knew this person you know whether or not you like them that's of course like i i can appreciate like i don't scotty is a jerk from from pretty much right away i don't blame anyone for not liking him i think the the three women Cheryl, linda and shelly we you know they just they come across as nice people you know good people and ash also you know he seems to genuinely want you know like i think it it's it's one of the very first lines he has is basically like you know i'm i'm sure we'll have a good time kind of thing you know and it's just it's it's not like it's not shakespeare that comes later but it just yeah you 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 know, four out of five ain't bad. Four out of five of the characters, you want to see good things happen to them, you know. And, yeah, the fact that you see all these horrible things happening, not just to... to that, that's, again, like... The, the Friday the 13th movies, they... One of the... A, a writer of at least one of the movies, or, uh, or was it a producer, someone who worked on one of the, at least one of the movies, specifically said in an interview that he thought it would just get depressing if you liked the characters and then you saw them die. So he felt that they should be obnoxious. They should be completely unlikable. And yeah, you know, mission accomplished. Most of them are. Not all. But a lot of characters in the Friday the 13th franchise are just not very likable. And, you know, he's right. He's, he's entitled to his opinion. I don't think that we should be watching horror movies hoping that something bad will happen to a human being. But, you know, anyway. the the But, yeah. You know, this movie goes for making us want good things to happen to them and then subjects us to you know i i get why the 117 minute version was thought to be too grim you know it, usually it's the the studio who tells you to cut down the movie by that much you know from 117 minutes to what was it 85 you know was that 32 minutes or so, you know, that's, that's not nothing, and, yeah, you know, they, they ended up, they, they watched it back, and they were like, okay, this is too much, you know, I, I 100% understand, and, and there are people who would say, as it is, this movie goes too far, you know, this was, I believe this was one of the video nasties, you know, this was, like, banned in the UK, you know, and, yeah, you know, I can, I can, I can understand why I disagree with it. I there's very very few cases where I agree with censorship, you know, but I can understand why people would think this is just this goes too far, you know. The, there's the there's the point of view that you might watch this and engage in cruelty yourself. You know, I don't agree that it's going to do that to someone who doesn't have it in them, but I can appreciate not wanting a movie to wake that up in someone, some, you know, so, so, yeah, but it's definitely, yeah, the movie gets a lot out of the fact that we're seeing these truly horrible things happen to people that we really want positive things to be happening to, and, 
the fact that it's not just like there's a lot of you know Friday the Thirteenth where it's just like you know you you see a character and then later they're found dead and you know it's like oh it's a cool effect but then you just kind of move on in this that never happens there is no I'm, I'm not gonna tell you how many characters you know live you know how many characters if any survive this entire movie but I will tell you no one goes down easy no one in this movie dies without a lot of suffering and that is part of the just you know it's it's very cathartic because you watch it and then afterwards you feel like okay now my life is going to be cruelty free uh, you know at least for a while you know there's also some very effective stunts which is impressive because they were just the actors they didn't have like professional stunt you know yeah but you can see their pain on screen which yeah and yeah just also the yeah the violence and gore there's a lot of creativity to it you know this was one of the first of like horror movies where when something bad happens it is very very graphic and very detailed it's i'm not saying it is the first but yeah and that yeah i will talk about sexual content in the spoiler sections but not i i can't talk about them without spoilers so the the dvd is is quite good you know there's the the one i have at least you know has two commentary tracks one with Rainey and bob tabbert and one with Campbell, and both commentary tracks are informational and funny. There are, you know, there's a there's a list where it says five trailers. It's really, it's one trailer and and TV spots and four TV spots. Uh, you know, the the five in total come to four minutes. There's a seven and a half minute panel discussion from some sort of convention, I, I believe. And there's a 13 minute, you know, featurette called Discovering Evil Dead about the distribution, it getting, well, discovered. And 18 minutes of, you know, deleted scenes or unused takes. They're fine, you know, would have been very cool if they had a proper behind the scenes, but I get why they weren't, you know, they weren't going to waste film. They were already running out of money, running out of actors, you know, struggling to, to make it. Of course, they're not going to sit down and film behind the... They're not going to shoot B-roll and, and have a bunch of sit-downs with actors that they can't even get to stay for the entire shoot, you know, which, you know, I, I, as far as I understand, like, the actors stayed as long as they had originally agreed to. You know, it just so happened that they hadn't finished all the filming, and, and that I do think is very fair, you know. But, but yeah, um, you know, if you're not super into trying to figure out how the movie was made and, and trying to pick up every little clue, the 18-minute deleted scenes are probably going to feel tedious to you, uh, I, I would say. You know, I, I thought they were pretty fascinating because you, you get a sense of, you know, but, yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, you know, I mean... I wouldn't pay like a huge exorbitant amount for it, but if you can get it on sale, I, I do think that it is worth, yeah. And I rate this 10 horrifying passion projects out of 10. I'm not saying that everything about the movie is perfect. I'm saying that the strengths so greatly outweigh the weaknesses. You know, yeah. Um... Yeah, the movie you know holds up very well. There's there's a few things that have dated. And it is a movie that is still very uh, you know beloved. The you know there's there's stuff in this movie that is very clearly deliberately referenced in Evil Dead Rise, you know, a movie that came out was it this year? I, I guess last year by now. Um, you know, so, yeah. No, it, that's right, it was this year. 
So, yeah, 42 years later. Wait, yeah, yeah, 42 years after original release, it's still getting, you know, it's getting sequels, it's getting, or, it's getting franchise entries, it's getting references in those franchise entries. You know, there's a lot of amazing movies that have not had as long of a legacy as this, you know, and I want to say, are they still doing the thing where they put, like, I'm, I'm almost certain that Ash appears, let's see, Ash Williams, I believe he's appeared in at least some of the Mortal Kombat, huh, oh, here we go. Um, yeah, there are, there are multiple video games, including, like, specific, yeah, sp like, specific, um, Evil Dead-centric games. Let's see, there's at least, I'm seeing at least three. Um, the character appears in some, some other games, including Telltale Games, Poker Night 2, along with Sam from Sam and Max, Claptrap from Borderlands, Brock Samson from The Venture Bros, and GLaDOS is the game's dealer. Very cool. And, um, let's see. Oh, and there's a, there's a run-and-gun platform game called Broforce with Ash Broliums instead of Williams. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's right. And they, yeah, just last year there was an, yeah, literally, Evil Dead The Game, a asymmetric survival horror game. And Ash is a playable character. So, yeah. Um, I could have sworn I heard that he was in at least one, like, combat, like, like, um, Mortal Kombat or something. Maybe I'm thinking of someone else. Anyway, but yeah, you know, the, the, yeah, long legacy, this, this film, this franchise. It, it, there's a chance that it wouldn't be as big, if not for the later, for, for movies two and three and the remake and such, but, yeah. So, yeah, my, my updated ranking containing all five movies, and I know some people are going to say this is absolutely absurd, but ultimately it is the lowest. And that's not because it's not an amazing movie. I believe, but by, by this point in the video, you realize I love this movie. I do think that each of these movies just gets better and better and better. And I, I completely understand. I know some people are going to crucify me in the comments for, you know, putting this one below the remake. And, and some people also don't think that Rise lives up to the, the rest of the franchise. But the rest of them are, you know, all of these, all five movies are absolutely amazing. And the fact that I place it at the bottom does not mean that I think it is a bad movie. It's just that the rest of them are even more amazing. This is a franchise that just got better and better and better. And when it comes to the overall yeah I'll briefly so all of the Sam Raimi movies that I've watched ranked worst to best Spider-Man 3 is the only one I don't love Spider-Man 3, Drag Me to Hell, Oz, The Quick and the Dead, The, the Gift, Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, Evil Dead 1, Evil Dead 2, Doctor Strange 2, Evil Dead 3, A Simple Plan, and Dark Man 1 and that brings us to the spoiler sections so from here on out there will be massive spoilers you have been warned and I'm also not entirely sure much of what I say in the video is gonna make sense to anyone who hasn't watched the movie but yeah um, starting with notes taken while watching as usual on paper so yeah from frame one this starts building tension and suspense and, and atmosphere very very nicely you know, we, we, we hear this oh, sound of a, of a fly, which just is, you know, nobody wants a fly near them. 
you know, if I guess if you're like a salamander, maybe, but otherwise, you know, and we see the fog, and just it's very ominous, and then we get the the very first of numerous POV shots, and yeah, you know, we we meet the the our main characters, and you know, I um, what are the names again? Uh, is I believe it's Cheryl with the pad of paper. You know, the several of them are singing. You know, happy young people. Great contrast between the happy young people and this evil demonic force. And yeah, from from the moment we meet them, Ash is slow to act. You know, slow with the with the map. Scotty is not being careful enough, like, looking away from the road, you know, yeah, stupid, making bad decisions, so, yeah, we, we get a sense of who the, yeah, Cheryl the artist, Ash the, the well-meaning, but a little too slow to be that useful in a very important situation, you know, it's apparently also his fault that the car almost well, well, no, yeah, wait. He said he took the car in. Scotty is like, well, it's not working, you know. It was the evil force messing with them, you know, tormenting them from right away. And, let's see. yeah, we get the, the bridge very, very nice and, and creepy. And something I really appreciate, you don't realize this the first time you watch it, but, you, you know, after several watches, you realize you don't actually see very much of the bridge, like, starting to fall apart. You see a little. I'm not saying there's none. But a lot of it is is because we hear the, the creaky, it sounds like the wood is just about to give under the weight of the car. But it's, the visual is just the car moving across the, the bridge, you know, and then it cuts to below and they're dropping some of the it's murder beams and just yeah you know and and we have the one gag the the wheel poking through one of you know there's a yeah it reaches a certain point and just breaks you know breaks through goes the the wheel starts poking into the hole ash opens the door and looks and you know and it's murder beam and you know just yeah very very nicely done it it really really works to, you know, you get the sense that this is not, they, they should not be going in, and, you know, they also bring up in the car, like, so nobody has seen this place yet, you know, this, uh, yeah. And, yeah, they reach the cabin, and the, the, the I'm going to call it swing, I'm not sure if that's the, the appropriate term, but I think you know what I mean, you know, it keeps banging into the side of the cabin, and, and just the noise, you just want it to stop, because it's just so unsettling, you know. And Scotty moves all the way up, and then it stops. And then you're like, no, you know what? I, uh, I was wrong. Please, please don't stop. Because that's just, no. Like, if someone walked up and stopped it, sure. But don't just stop like that after the, because it's like, the wind couldn't have moved it like that, and then just stop like that, because the wind wasn't, like, changing. So just wonderfully done, you know, and Scotty's staying there with the keys, and the camera's nice and far away from the rest, so you're like, oh, something bad's gonna happen to him, you know. And... Let's see. And, and just the, the detail that, you know, he reaches up to find the keys, which is, a, you know, that's, yeah, that's a decent enough place to, to put keys, you know, it's pretty easy for, for thieves to find them, but it was recently sold, so I'm guessing, you know, maybe they aren't too worried about thieves, maybe it's a, so secluded that just nobody gets to there, which is not quite the reality with the, lo the shooting location, but, you know, and, yeah, you know, we, we see the shot from up above, of him reaching up and, and grabbing the keys, and then he has to to try. I, it's like the second or third he tries that that he finds, you know. And in the moment, it's just kind of creepy and and foreboding, and you know. 
But then later, when Cheryl has to try to get the key and and it's like slightly stuck and the just yeah. And yeah, and we get you know, they're they're unloading the car and the girls are throwing the the bags, you know, for the first several bags, Ash catches and then at one point, you know, the the he one of them hits him in the solar plexus and the other girl throws a bag at like his you know, his upper half is just, yeah. And with that, Bruce Campbell's substantial physical comedy career began. And very ominous clock and the 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 fact that it just stops and it's this great thing because like the they had like a um what do they call clock I'm gonna go with clockmaker you know they they went to one where like okay so can you make the clock stop can you make it move backwards and it was like yeah sure no no problem at all you pay me I'll do it no problem and it's the kind of thing when we see it it's very off-putting but it's not actually super difficult you know like we have to keep in mind like clocks don't move because time passes clocks move because we made them to move so it's just as easy like maybe maybe today some would would not because you know a lot of clocks today are, are like digital so it you know they're not necessarily made to run backwards and and stop just some, unless it's like a stopwatch or something, but like yeah back then yeah it's, it's fine you know it just it's the same parts that they just you just gotta adjust them in the in the other direction but when you see it in a film you're like oh that's not right there's something terribly wrong here because when we see a clock when we see the the, the thing ticking we're like oh yeah yeah because because time is passing yeah. You know, because we don't think about no, no, it's, the clocks are this man-made thing. You know, they're not even like a hugely old, ancient thing. You know, unless you're like going over sundials, which those it is very much like, you know, it's like yeah, it's the the sun moving across the sky kind of thing. But the the second hand moving, that's just, you know, yeah. Um, but the but the moment we see it stop, it's like. Something's horribly wrong here, <laughs> you know. And it's those. It's it's such simple but incredibly effective things like that that just yeah. And the the yeah, Cheryl's hand is possessed and draws the the book of the dead, you know. And and then she sees the the ah. Uh, the basement door, yeah, you know, open a little, and then it's closed, you know, and yeah, you know, this is the the spirits are already, you know, already want, you know, and there's also is uh, is that the first time you hear join us? I think it might be, yeah, you know, they're already trying to lure in the the you know the group. But they can't, they can't completely, they can't possess an entire body yet. You know, they can possess a hand. Yeah, 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 it, it seems like, or a mild possession of a hand. Compel her to, to write, you know. And it cuts to, to the, the blender full of red stuff and, you know, in the, in the commentary track, you know, I, I think it is Raimi himself who admits, you know, this jump scare didn't completely work. You know, I know it's obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not... I am not going to tell Sam Raimi today something that he as a filmmaker does not already know way better than me. But, and, and I'm not saying, you know, oh, just, you know, hop in a time machine, go back and fix it. But hypothetically, I think... Something you know, if it if the blender had taken up the entire screen, and then you know you pull the camera out slightly, I think that might have worked slightly better because as it is, you almost immediately realize, oh yeah, you know it's it's a it's a blender. You know there, um, I would say the opening credits of American Psycho 
do a better job with you know making us think oh, is that blood and then revealing no it's not you know but like it's it's a blender full of red liquid you know I it's it's not blood that's you know but if it if it filled the screen and it's possible that that was what was in the script they had the camera close and they they shot it both ways and then in editing it just you know maybe the lighting was off on the you know it's it's difficult filmmaking as you know there's a lot of you have to make a lot of uh, what's the word there's a lot there's a lot of things that can't that won't necessarily go exactly as you hoped and the speech at the table is cut to ribbons because they had stuff there and they found okay this is not working let's just let's keep cutting it down until we have bare bones that's why it's keep it keeps cutting like ash will get a, a word or two out and then it cuts to a reaction shot so like originally it was longer and they just it just didn't completely work but at least they did cut it down you know there's there's similar scenes in like friday the 13th movies where it's like okay you, we get the point you're not really making any Nothing's happening, you know, can, can we move it along? And the, you know, really nicely done with, you know, one of the, one of the girls in the foreground, and in the background we have the, the cellar door, which I am, you know, reliably informed is the most beautiful phrase in the English language, and it pops open, you know, it's like, oh, this is bad, this is bad, this is, the, you know, because this is the biggest thing that the spirits have done so far. And we just know there's something, you know, because, yeah, Cheryl was just sitting there. We know there's something in there that they want us to see, and we don't want seen. And, yeah, really nicely done is the camera, you know, just gradually move, you know, everyone gets a brief line, then it moves on to the next, and the next, and the next, until I, all five have delivered a line before the, the basement. And Scotty, the dumbass, is the first to go into the basement. And then the jerk doesn't respond when they're all calling, you know, because, yeah, he likes to prank people. And love when Ash, get, you know, the, uh, g give me a flashlight. We only brought the one. Okay, give me the lantern then. Because, you know, if I am pretty much willing to bet money that Sam Raimi sat down and he was like, how do I get someone carrying a lantern to explore this dark, dingy basement. Because that's just so much cooler. It's just a flashlight. Who cares about a flash? It's, it's way better. So, you know, I'll have two people go into the basement. The first one brings the flashlight. Why would they bring more than one flashlight? You know, who's going to need a second flashlight? You know, they're only bringing the bare essentials. The bare necessities of life. And just the, the sight of Bruce Campbell looking around. You know, he goes all the way down the... the stairs and the camera does a full 360 to to give us a sense of the surroundings absolutely love it and yeah just such a creepy basement you know the pipes with the water dripping down and it's this thing of like it's it's very off-putting for us but like if you think about the filmmaking side i mean yeah they just they you know the, either the pipes were there or they had to hang them up or something and they would like drip some water on top of it and film as it you know but when we see it it's like oh please get out of this place this is horrible you know this is so off-putting and and I really appreciate you know it's already very creepy in the basement now it gets so much worse so much more aggressive later in the film and yeah they find the book and the knife which are both great props this is also something that not all horror movies from the I'm, I'm not sure I don't yeah I'm I think it was several to be clear makeup from the start Friday the 13th all the way through great it's at least some not all of it but each movie has at least one thing where it's like wow that was a really cool makeup job but I would argue that it's several movies in before we get the first, like, super memorable prop. 
where in this movie, like, that book and the knife just really, really, you know, so, so creepy looking. You know, and the, the book is, of course, going to get an absolutely epic introduction in the second movie, you know, but yeah. And and also just the, the idea of this book that was... The pages... Well, well let's see. Or is, or is it just the... It, maybe it's just the out, outside of it is like human flesh, and it's inked in human blood, you know, just... Use a pen, Sideshow Bob. And... Yeah, and they start listening to the tape, and Cheryl gets, you know, really freaked out by it. And Scotty, you know, does the, they're coming to get you, Barbara, thing. Let's see. And I kind of love how unapologetically cheesy the the romantic necklace bit is like you know keep like you know he's like okay she's gone and you know sneaks in and and you know she comes back he's sitting there with the with a little box which you know yeah obviously that's some sort of jewelry and obviously it's for her you know we know they're together we know they they're happy together so yeah he's giving her you know some sort of present there and you know, she keeps reaching for it, and then, you know, his eyes open slightly, and then she looks, no, he closed his eyes again, you know, and, you know, wonderful when later he's, like, trying to bury her body, and the, yeah, we again, you know, now she's the one opening her eyes and, and closing them before he looks, so just, yeah, love the, the setup and payoff throughout this movie. And, yeah, you know, uh, wait, did I say Cheryl? I'm uh, right. Obviously, Cheryl is not the girlfriend. That would be icky because they're siblings. Uh, Linda is Ash's girlfriend. But, yeah, you know, and Cheryl hears the, the voices, you know, join us. And, you know, her words, no, don't. But her actions say, sure, got nothing better to do. You know, and the woods attack. Because that was something that Raimi really loved from one of the Shakespeare plays when, like, reading it in high school or something. You know, he liked the ideas of the, idea of the woods attacking someone. And that's, you know, that's a major part of this movie is this thing of the, the, the fact that nature has not truly been tamed. You know, nature itself has not. We have tamed parts of, uh, yeah. And, yeah, uh, I have more to say about the, the wood attack, the, the rape itself. I will talk about probably in the next section, but yeah. For now, uh, you know, and, and yeah, after the attack, she's fleeing the, the POV, which is understandable. Uh, that is Sam Raimi carrying the camera. He's, you know coming to torment her again, as he does with his actors. You know, he, he got a little less aggressive with that after this movie. You know, he didn't do it to his entire cast like he did on this movie after this. It, on, on some of his more mainstream features, but, yeah. And, yeah, the, the keys thing again, and I love, you know, she ends up dropping it, and, you know, she's reaching for the keys, and then a hand you know, grabs her, and then we see, and it's it's Ash. You know, he 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 eventually heard her, after you know she she has to scream for a while before they hear. But you know, he he opened the door, and you know, because it's one of those that you know you you unlock it from the outside with a key, but on the inside there's just a, a thing you can flip to to yeah. You know, which is it's great because there's it's only the first of many times that a hand will pop into frame and and grab someone. But I think this is the only time that it's like, I think it's the first time. Yeah, um, it's the it's the only time where it's a friendly. You know, the rest of the times it's a deadite, which I suppose right. One of deadite is what they refer to as the possessed. You know, I, I don't think they say the word in this movie at all. But that's what, is it maybe the second movie or was it a fan thing? I forget. But yeah, and. 
Right, and I love that, you know, when she finally, you know, she gets in, the door is closed, the POV gets close, and then it retreats. So it's this thing of, like, it's waiting. You know, it's not, it didn't give up. You know, it doesn't turn around and sullenly slink back into the, the wood hole that it climbed out of when, you know, they they listen to the... the I, I also appreciate, like, you know, the the guy on the, the the professor on the tape like nobody forced him to to read it in such a creepy way you know that's like because because he basically at this point he thinks you know he doesn't think it's gonna work because otherwise he wouldn't be doing it you know he's not as he's not scotty he's not stupid but yeah he still chooses it to read it in such a creepy way and yeah at first the car won't start and Cheryl insists that the spirits won't let them leave, and then it does, and Ash gives her a look, but then, you know, a minute later, the bridge is out, so that's how they prevented them from leaving, and I really appreciate that the bridge, you know, it's not just like, oh, it's, you know, whatever, they can't use the bridge. No, no, no. It looks like a, f like, the, 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 um, what's it called? Like, the spirits, like, took possession of the bridge, and we're like in the process of like clenching the bridge into a fist. Like you straight up, it looks like a hand that's like, uh, you know, trying to squeeze or something. Just love it. They, they did, you know, they didn't have to do that. It could have just been that, oh, they got there. Oh, no. I, you know, this is the spot where the bridge is supposed to be, but this, it's just empty now. No, no, no. It like, it's just, yeah, love it. And I I do think the axe jump scare works. You know the the we see the axe hit something and it, oh it's just firewood. You know no no big deal. And I do quite like I I don't know why but it is kind of funny that you know ah, crap I forget which is but you know Linda and and Shelley you know one of them is like testing the other to see if they're psychic and the other like. At first, she actually did guess the, the coat right, but then she says, no, 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 it's not that. And then she gets it wrong. You know, she keeps getting the, the several cards. She gets at least two cards wrong. And the other's like, oh, you're psychic. This is amazing. I, I don't know why it's so funny, but it just, yeah, it's just such a silly, yeah. And the demon is 100% able to, to, you know, yeah. To pick the the card and I don't know why but it just it's a really good way of because like it makes it clear that whatever is going on with Cheryl now it's not just oh oh you know it's like oh, she's, she's sick I guess she's looking kind of pale and you know her eyes are a little messed up no no there's definitely something supernatural. There's some kind of psychic thing. She clearly cannot see the card. You know, you know, maybe the the spirit can like see everything that goes on in the cabin. Maybe she's like reading the mind of the person who's holding up the card, you know, but clearly there's something else going on there. And you know, you see her like, levitating and they legit like today you'd have like a professional ring and wire you know no they just like they did a thing and you know yanked them up in the air and held them there briefly and just yeah um and for some reason like at first when Cheryl is speaking with, with the demonic voice you don't see her lips move which I always thought was yeah, I, if I understand correctly, it was basically that, like, at first there wasn't supposed to be a line there, but then in, like, post-production they felt like, oh, there should, there should be a line there. Or maybe they, part way through shooting, decided whether or not, you know, at first they thought it worked better if the, the Cheryl's lips didn't move when the demon spoke or something. I don't know, but, yeah, she, you know, and she attacks... Like, originally it was supposed to be like, oh, you know, stabbing the foot, which is already, like, uh, you know. But no, it's the Achilles tendon, you know, and, like, buries the the strong-ass pencil 
in there and like twisting and like it just and and like tearing the, you know like essentially using it as if it was a knife cutting through just you know which I mean she's an artist she needs strong pencils and I really appreciate the the demon the demonic taunting you know just ma makes it so much it's just creepier and, and scarier and I love the POV you know they managed to get her into the basement and the camera is like looking at the the you know it's yeah it's the POV of Cheryl from the basement looking at them and you know turns as she turns to look at the different ones oh god what happened to her eyes <sighs> Rosemary baby we went over this. Okay, just, yeah. And, yeah. The, the, the POV attacking through the, the window was, you know, also very effective. And the fact, you know, you hear the scream and you see, you see Ash and you see Scotty and it's like, what now, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, Scotty goes and he looks through the window, notices, ah, oh, look, the fog machine's on. And we get a psycho reference with the, you know, pulling out the, the shower curtain. And it's great that, you know, no one's behind the shower curtain, which, you know, not the case in Psycho. Someone was on both, someone was on one side, someone's on the other side. But there was someone in the room, you know, and you know, scratches his face. I don't know why, but the fact that the blood, like, some of it gets on his, one of his t teeth, and it's just, ugh, ugh, stop that. It's so, so gross and so nasty, and I love it. And then we have the, yeah, the, the demon knocks Ash into the shelves, knowing that that is his one weakness. And the biting off the hand is just, ugh, you know, it's, like, it's already, like, let's appreciate here, Sam Raimi started with the idea, you know, it would be really gnarly if someone, like, lost a hand, if someone, like, cut a hand off in this movie. And then I was like, you know what would be even cooler is if it was bitten off by the Deadite herself, you know, just, yeah, and the... The knife in the back, really, yeah. And I love, they cut up the body, and all the, the body parts are moving, and it's in one shot, and that's the kind of thing that we hadn't really seen before. Like, you might see a body part cut off and, and still be moving in some way, but it's one shot, and there's like four or five different movements, you know. And, yeah, like in real life, they just had, like, people under the floorboards, like, at the same time, each maneuvering, uh, manipulating different body parts, you know. And, yeah, and the possession of the foot is also really creepy. And so, before leaving, Scotty says there must be another way, like a trail or something, and he's going to leave you know, leaving the others behind because he's a massive, raging douchebag. And, you know, because Ash is like, I mean, I can't move my girlfriend in her condition. I'm not going to leave her here, you know, in, in her current condition. And it's kind of like, I mean, she's your girlfriend. I don't care what happens to her. It's like, oh my freaking God, you know, and just, yeah. But yeah, you know, he's seemingly not sure there's a trail, and then he comes back, and he's like, there's a trail, so I guess he found it in those few minutes that he was gone, but yeah, I mean, that works, that's not a problem. And, right, and apparently, later on, Ash pulls something that's meant to be a branch out of Scotty's body, which, you know, produces blood spurts. Apparently, some people didn't realize that, you know, there was a branch there, so they thought that Ash 
broke the bro code and yanked off a particularly sensitive piece of equipment, but no, that is not what they intend. Even Sam Raimi, at this point, you know, he'll he'll tree rape a woman, but he's not gonna have a, you know, castration like that. But but yeah, um, and apparently some people didn't even fully realize that he had that Scotty had been attacked by the woods, or at least that it was as bad and. Yeah, can't help but note that we do see it for the the tree rape for the woman is shown, but the tree attack for the guy is not at all shown for as much violence as this movie wants to, to show. I love when the demons pretend to have dispossessed Linda and Cheryl and just like, you know, th there's this one part where like her head is like flopping and you know she goes down and then it comes back up and she's like crying and it's her normal face and she's like please don't you know I'm I'm okay now and you know you you hear Cheryl's voice from the basement you don't see the head which is already you know at this point it's the it's a just a fixture of the room you know the the head is there you're hearing the the banging and it's just, you know taunting but the the do you think the line what happened to her eyes was written before or after they realized that you know when she put the tupperware on the on the eyes it can only be there for 15 minutes before they have to take it back off anyway you know the, the yeah you hear Cheryl's voice come on it's your sister and we in the audience are like oh it's a sister right that's why she's there she is related to one of them it's not you know it's less weird that they brought a single woman to... <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, you know, it's, it's just so creepy that, that you... And, and it is clearly, you know, it is actual cruelty on the, on the part of the spirits. They're just doing it to, to really twist the blade. You know, they, they don't even particularly get any more access to to their pliable bodies it's just just to screw with them why are you torturing me like that Sam answer Bruce like seriously they, he did apparently like torture Bruce in in school as well and I've seen other movies where someone like licks blood off a knife I don't know why it it just feels so much grosser I'm not gonna act it out don't worry but it I think it's the fact that it takes so long I think she spends three seconds straight you know as she you know she she starts with the with the tip of the knife at the or it, yeah, never mind the other yeah the other end of the knife and you know, in her tongue, and the licks all the way to the tip, and it takes maybe three seconds, and it's just—it's so, just ugh. And that's also like a very like. That's a it's a good visual shorthand for sadism, even if there had as much sadism as there had already been. And Ash almost uses the chainsaw but realizes ah, the budget is not quite big enough uh, I'll have to wait for the sequels and Ash cries you know as, as Linda lies before him realizing how terrible that necklace truly is and yeah and then we have the bit where you know Ash is looking for Linda's eyes to, to open really excellent with the when when the the burial you know the the dirt on it it covers most of the camera lens other than just you know Bruce standing there and then the rest of it and it's completely covered just wonderfully and apparently they got that they were just lucky that it took so few you know that they got it so well in in that take and yeah you know it is of course you know, I we also have the line we can't bury Shelley. She's a friend of ours. But you know, yeah, it 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 is only right to to bury any 
sense of taste and decency from Sam Raimi's career. I'm kidding. Later, he made much more tasteful stuff. And that brings us to the last bit of... Right, and also, yeah, when Linda is, like, on top of Ash, but without the head, you know, and, and spraying blood in his face and mouth, like, there's a there's one shot where, like, if you, you know, if you took it out of context, it kind of looks like she's, like, trying to, to ride him sexually, but it's so morbid, you know, and again, like, there are other movies where a character dies. There are other movies where a character comes back to life after dying. But the the fact that it's also it has this sexual element to it just makes it so much like more it's it's you know it's breaking several taboo in, in just one yeah. And that is also like I can't help but note that like you know yeah it's implied that Scotty and Shelley have sex when they, you know, both get shirtless. But the only times we see something that really looks like sex in this movie, it's tree rape and it's beheaded Linda deadite on top of Ash, you know. I don't think it was by accident. And, yeah, we go back to the basement and it's even nastier and we get the, the voices from before and the you know there's blood dripping down the the projector and covering the bed and and again just for some reason it's just so effective to see blood you know running down the 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 back of the you know projector and the the music comes on and it's like you know if i was listening to that music in a in a different you know, I, I, let's see, I read somewhere, I think it's, it's like, it, yeah, it's just, it's the Charleston, you know, it's, it's a perfectly lovely piece of music, you know, people used to dance to it, but they, you know, they went and made it this super creepy, and, and also just the fact that the record player starts without, somehow it is creepier than if a deadite went and put a record on you know, but the fact that, you know, with stop motion magic, it, it starts playing this thing and, and then it like slows down and just it's so, so creepy. And yeah. And the clock starts running backwards. Love the mirror gag with just, you know, goes up to the mirror, you know, and, and plunges his hands into it because now it's water and it's, you know, yeah, water reflects, you know, if you have a completely still water surface, yeah, it can look as if it's a mirror from the right, with the right camera work and such, and just, yeah. And, yeah, the, the climax does feel a bit like a haunted house, like he's just going around different places and something will pop out or something. I, I love it. I suppose I can see why some people might not. And Scotty, you know, comes and attacks, and the, you know, Ash, um, like, what's it called? Like, um, gouges out the eyes with his thumbs, and just so much, you know, stuff running over faces, just so nasty. And the necklace proves to be useful in a profoundly silly way. Apparently, originally, it was supposed to, like, the, there's a... Uh, what's it called? Like a magnifying glass at the end. That's why it looks so hideous. That was supposed to like use the sunlight to to set the the book on fire. And they changed their minds. And they were stuck with a terrible looking prop. And you know, so yeah, it's uh, okay. He uses it to lasso in the the book, even though that's completely ridiculous. And they bothered, you know, they they. You know, there's a shot where it's just lying there. They bother to shape it like a, a skull to just really make it, yeah. And really, really cool when the the dead eyes start melting as the book burns, and then it's like partially alive. And it's not just that you know, oh, it moves a little. No, no, no like massive, nasty looking tongue pops out, and you know, just so just. And, and I think it's worth appreciating the level of detail they go into 
with the the motion um, the claymation melting of the the bodies here at the end like it really they they put a lot of effort into you know and then it's like okay now everything's done right because the book is you know books in the fireplace the the everything has gone quiet you know the the deadites have started melting and such and nope then like explosions and not only it's, you know not only does it fly away from where it started it you know really hits Bruce's face need a hand because the deadites as they're melting have several and just these nice long finger nails and you know there's a, I want to say it's Scotty's body like two hands you know they, they stick out from the like the front and the back and one of the one of the dead eyes is on the floor and like multiple arms sting out and again you know as far as filmmaking goes not the hardest they you know they they under the floorboards they have some people with you know the the yeah fake the the I'm guessing that they put the nails and and such on people's actual hands and they're just you know and I guess for the for the body with it sticking out that's like a prop body and yeah like people are are standing yeah it's probably just it's probably one person standing to the side and sticking out the the hands so it looks like it's sticking out of it's something like that you know but it's yeah very very effective and at one point like bugs come out of the decomposing bodies and I love the final POV shot, you know, they, they had to have people, like, open the door and, and such, you know, so that the camera can, can go through, you know, and it starts, and it, at first it doesn't look like it's going to be a POV shot, and that's something I, you know, that I really appreciate, that you, that you really pick up on, on, on multiple viewings. At first it just looks like, oh, the camera, you know, this is one of the last shots, because there's several... You know, there's a brief, like, not not like montage, not like montage se sequence, but like there's several shots edited to, to just say, you know, it's morning, you survived the night, and we get the sense it's going to be okay. You know, and there are a lot of horror movies from the 80s where there's at least one survivor, there's at least, there's some ray of sunshine at the end, there's some hope. But nope, that is not what Sam Raimi is going for. So the camera starts moving and the doors open. And Bruce is standing with his back turned, and he turns around and sees the, you know, and the camera goes all the way up and, you know, yeah, attacking him. And it was apparently, it wasn't supposed to be like a sequel tease or anything. It was supposed to be closure. It was supposed to say, no, even he does not survive. Nobody survives this night, you know. And the, the ghoulish squeal scream that he makes there at the end is just epic, like... Kind of thing, just it's it's completely ridiculous, and I I absolutely love it. You know, there's a reason that they took this last bit and made the menu loading animation for at least some DVDs of this movie. You know, and and they include the the screen there, so each time I pop the movie in, you know, I hear it when the menu opens, and I hear it again at the end of the movie. So I've heard it a lot of times, and I never tire of hearing it. And that brings us to the final section, which is entitled Notes Taken Before Watching. So, yeah, the tree rape is completely unnecessary. It's 100% within the logic of the movie for her to simply be infected by being scratched by one of the trees. That's all it takes for the other people is a bite or a scratch, and that kind of thing. And apparently, originally, Raimi wasn't planning on it being raped. It was suggested, he agreed. He has since admitted that it was a mistake. And to be clear, I'm not saying that no movie can ever depict the act of rape among my favorite movies or Monster, but that's a movie that actually explores the after effects of rape. It doesn't just use it to shock the audience. This movie doesn't really explore the impact that it has, the way she reacts. It seems more like those scenes were not rewritten after they changed it to rape. You know, it seems more like she's reacting to being attacked by trees. And, yeah, you know, the the... 
anyone who studies this sort of thing and is intellectually honest will tell you the trauma effect is different when it's a sexually charged attack. So, yeah. Um, wish that the movie had not done that. I, I think it would have been much more... Yeah, you know. Um, let's see. And... Right, and I think, you know, the, I, I heard, I want to say it was Raimi saying, you know, oh, but then, you know, later, like, it's like Linda is trying to rape Ash. And, you know, I mentioned that in the, in the previous spoiler section. I appreciate that there is something there, but it's just not the same. There is not an even playing ground. Women have been sexualized, treated as sexual objects since basically as long as human society has existed at all. And when a woman is reduced to a sexual object in a piece of media, yeah, it, it hurts women in a way that trying to do the same with a male character just, it, it doesn't with the way that culture has been for, you know, I, I mean, I guess if some point in the future, if there's like some apocalyptic event and society starts over and like this movie is one of the the pieces of media that survive and we we start over completely it's egalitarian maybe to them it would feel like it's the same thing for her to be raped and later linda to attempt to rape ash but as it is it yeah and i don't think the movie needed it because there's so many other shocking things in the movie now, yeah, so the movie as mentioned earlier is very misogynistic. It is true that there is a lot of violence towards men as well, but violence against women in media can normalize violence against women in real life in a way that just isn't the same when it comes to depictions of violence against men. There are cases where women have been very severely punished, including by the quote-unquote justice system, for fighting back when men have committed a lot of violence against a woman, and the woman finally tries to defend herself, even if she doesn't hurt him. There's one case where a woman, Marisa Alexander, clearly fired the gun, careful not to injure the man, but was punished basically as if she tried to kill him, sentenced to 20 years. It took the jury 12 minutes to make this decision. And, you know, the defense tried to invoke the stand your ground law, which has got men off killing on purpose, but because she was a woman and black, people wanted her to suffer. Ultimately, there was a movement that succeeded in making the penalty less severe, but there's countless other cases where women have been punished for daring to not simply take whatever violence a man wanted to dish out. It's also, every single time there's a prominent case of a man physically abusing a woman, even when there's video evidence, even when it's really clear that it's the man doing something wrong, you have a lot of misogynists on social media, some are even willing to show their face, attach their real name to it, defending the man. And I hate to say it, but there is a segment, I'd like to think it's very small, of the horror movie fan community that enjoy watching women be hurt, at least in fiction. And I don't mean feeling a cathartic thrill of seeing violence in fiction, I mean literally they want to see women get hurt. Fiction is a way for them to do that without causing real-life violence or looking f you know, for videos of real-life violence. So, yeah. And it is, like, there's several scenes where it's stuff that, you know, men in real life could imitate. And, you know, there have been men who said, you know, they I, I don't know if, you know, saying that the woman was possessed is, you know, super common, but there are a lot of men who said, you know, they just couldn't help themselves. They just, you know, why wouldn't she just X, Y, and Z? You know, look what you made me do kind of thing. You know, there is a scene in this where one of the possessed women is hit with the butt of a gun, like, directly in the face multiple times, and, uh, let's see, I think this is also the one where, you know, a man, like, slaps a woman in the face, across the face multiple times, which used to be seen as just the way to get a woman to calm down. You know, so, yeah, really, really wish that, because you could so easily, the movie didn't have to have the misogyny at all. And it actually, you know, it has 
more female characters than male characters. Uh, you know, I guess unless you count the professor, but we know almost nothing about him. He has no visual presence in the movie at all. But, yeah. Um, that is everything, so... Yeah. Uh, hit me up in the comments, let me know what is your favorite scene from this movie. What are your hopes for the future of the franchise? Have you played any of the Evil Dead games? And, yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or more links to stuff like Realm of Playlists, that suggest a video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, one talking about my spoiler food thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which currently is Loki Season 2. And I try to do, it's, it doesn't get to be, uh, right, and I do a weekly video where I talk about one episode of a horror show that I have gotten around to watching, which, you know, this week was Scream Queens, starting next week will be Blood Curse. I, right, and, and, um, um, guess, yeah, tomorrow I will do the last episode of season two of The Bear, and once season three hits Disney+, Plus, I will do videos on that. I try to do every day, but I don't, it doesn't end up happening every day, a video talking about a, an episode of a Marvel TV show. I'm working my way through them in the order that they first aired, other than the Marvel Netflix ones, which I already did a little while back. But uh, right now, I am early in Season 2 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So, yeah. The... Um, yes. I, sh I should be able to do an episode of that show today. And one tomorrow. Maybe also Monday. We'll see. Uh, yeah. Recently reviewing thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if more videos like this, you're luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. And remember, you can't bury Shelly. She's a friend of ours.